All right, guys, welcome back to Highlander Hunting. Whether you are a beginner or expert hunter, our goal is to provide you with the helpful information on backcountry hunting on public lands. I'm Mike McRae. And I'm John McCann. And tonight we have a special guest with us. Uh, is a local guy named Chris Maxwell. Welcome, Chris. Hi, guys. Glad thanks to have for, you here. Yeah, thanks for having me. And you might recognize Chris's voice. He's been on a couple of other podcasts. He's been on the J. Scott Outdoors podcast and the Hunt Backcountry podcast, both from the United States. And Chris is a, um, he's a sheep hunter. He's, uh, he's on the board for the Wild Sheep Foundation here in Alberta, working on his Grand Slam. Uh, he's been on a lot of cool guided hunts. And uh, yeah, he's uh, just a great uh, resource of information on sheep and sheep hunting. So thanks for joining us tonight. Yeah, no, thanks for having me over. It's uh, always good to get together with local guys that <laughs> like doing the same thing you do. So. Yeah. Right on. <laughs> Welcome back to part two of Addicted to Altitude with Chris Maxwell. We're going to continue our discussion on sheep and sheep hunting. And this is going to be perfect timing for John and I because we're just getting ready to leave on Friday for our week-long bighorn sheep trip. Hope you enjoy. So ideally, you go out there and you're going to harvest one of these sheep. So um, what do you do? The sheep's down. Yeah. You got to butcher it out. You bone it out. Uh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, I, if you're, if you're backpacking, which I assume most guys starting out are going to do, they're not mm -hmm. going to hire a horse camp or an outfitter to go on their first sheep hunt, at least in Alberta anyways. Definitely plan on spending some time to bone the thing out, get as much weight off as you can. If you're going to do a shoulder mount, don't cape the whole thing out and keep the whole cape just for the sake of bringing the whole cape back. Just take what you're going to need. Any weight you can cut at that point is definitely a, a bonus. Um, whatever you do, don't leave anything behind, um, like in terms of meat or gear, because if you leave gear behind, that's garbage. If you leave meat behind, well, that's against the law, and you don't want to do that, not, not an animal like this or any animal for that matter. But you definitely want to have a plan on what you're going to do to get that thing out. So... I'm fortunate that I usually have, well, I always will take at least one other person with me if I go out. Um, if uh, we happen to have horses, that just makes the job 10 times easier. Yeah, I definitely would bone it out. Um, and the other thing I've been experimenting with too is a lot of guys will, even if they just bone the quarter out, they'll dump the quarter in their backpack. But um, I've been, I've got a few of those game bags with the zippers on them. And what I've actually been doing is even just cutting like a few roasts and things because they'll fit, you can fit a lot more into your pack when it's, um, it's in smaller bits basically because it'll fit in some of these crevices. And you can actually get a lot more in your pack than you think you can when you um, semi, I don't want to call it processing, but like semi process the meat mm -hmm. a little bit. Okay. That's a um, good idea. Yeah. So you're actually. You're not butchering it, but you're bringing it one step closer to being yeah to butchering. Yeah, and like say if <clears throat> I like say like not maybe not the roasts and the steaks because mm -hmm. you might probably want to spend some time to cut them up or get someone or get the butcher to cut them up properly. But like any of like I'm gonna call it like the hamburger meat. Yeah, you can definitely you know cut that down into more manageable size pieces mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. put them in those meat bags and they'll kind of fit around your other gear a bit better and. You get you stuff a lot more in anyway. Mm -hmm. I find yeah you can definitely um, probably get in more weight than you want to carry. <laughs> so, yeah. So what do you like using? Do you uh, do you like the skinning knife or are you a fan of the new Havilons or the Gerber blades? Um, the I haven't tried the Havilons yet with like the scalpels. I've been afraid to uh, <laughs> do them because I know so many guys have cut themselves with them. You just gotta be so careful and the blades snap and. So I, I'm kind of like a fan of the fixed blade okay. knife. And actually, what if it's a sheep, I won't even try to cape it myself. I, what I'll do, like what I've done anyways, is just cut it right at the base of the skull and then um, pack the whole thing out to, like the, the taxidermist do it. I'm just afraid to screw up a sheep cape, I yeah. guess. Yeah. Whereas if it's a deer, you know, you can get another one. Or, and when you're saying, like, cape yeah. it, do you mean, like, completely cape the face and everything, or...? Like, I won't cape the... I'll let the taxidermist cape the face yeah. and the ears and lips. Like, I'll actually pack the whole skull out with the horns. So it's it's way more weight than a guy should be packing out, probably. But, um, 
I guess, like, man, it's so hard, so hard to oh. get yeah. one that I'm scared to wreck in the... Here's a question for you, and I heard this third hand last year. Mm-hmm. Apparently, someone last year was on a sheep hunt, got one, and he did keep the face out himself. Mm-hmm. And when he brought it to the COs to get it registered, they actually ended up fining him because they couldn't prove that it was a legal ram. Oh, really? Does that make any that sense to you? doesn't make any sense to me because it's got the horns, right? So. so there was something to do with they could distinguish exactly where the eye was. Oh, okay. So I know. I think I know what you're talking about there. Did you hear the story? Have I, you heard I this one? Or? I okay. haven't heard this one. But so, and this is kind of like an old uh, sheep hunter's uh, tip, I guess, is on this four-fifths rule when you're looking for that tip at the uh, front of the eye if it's borderline being legal or not um people say leave the cape on the face because you'll the skin will cover up just a little bit more of that Mm -hmm. eye so it'll Mm -hmm. be easier you know you might only get a couple millimeters out of it but Mm -hmm. if it's right there you're better off to leave it on whereas if you cape it completely off you lose like that little eye gland. It bumps that imaginary line out a bit further. Yeah it bumps it out a couple mils and that might be the difference between keeping your sheep or not yeah um but that being said i know uh if it's close a lot of the game wardens will plug it anyway and call it legal just because if it goes to court chances are it's going to cost them a whole pile of money and right. the sheep hunter is going to get his sheep back from what i've been told anyway from previous cases but okay that being said it's probably a good idea not to shoot one that close if, mm-hmm. yeah exactly if uh you're not a hundred and ten percent certain that's legal. It's probably better to walk away than to chance it and hope that it's makes it. I yeah, guess. So, that's got to be tough to do, hey. Well, uh, yeah, like I I looked at I'm gonna say at least half a dozen sheep, like since I've been hunting anyway, that were like right there, and you know you just got to make the decision to walk mm-hmm. away. Like they, mm-hmm. uh, I bet probably three out of five of those rams might have been legal, legal. but. You know, if you get the wrong guy met or plug in the thing, or you just don't want the hassle, and you don't want a young ram either. So yeah, and that's probably the hardest thing for new sheep hunters yeah. to understand is you have to go out there, and I think you got to tell the new guys that they got to be willing to walk away if they're not yeah. like you say one hundred ten percent sure, and that's yeah. tough to do. Yeah, yeah, it's um, and you know, and the only way that, in my opinion, anyway, like if you're a new sheep hunter, you really should try to find a mentor, an older or I shouldn't say an older guy, but a guy that's been hunting them for a while that Mm -hmm. can tell you what to look for when you're looking at it. Because if you just go out there yourself and you come across a ram, chances are, unless it's like way past legal, you're just guessing if it is. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Um, But, you know, it's always good to have a second opinion on on something that's, even like mine was an inch. If you're, if that's the first ram you ever saw, you like you know you really just don't know what you're looking at mm-hmm. I guess. yeah so yeah. i'd say for like the new guys that want to get into this like it's a good yeah. practice going online and just looking yeah. at pe- pictures of sheep yeah and then yeah. trying to figure out if they're legal or not and and then looking at the regs or yeah and uh another uh, uh another tip a guy told me too was he, he told me i uh, get the the hunting magazines mm-hmm. and just look at the sheep in there um, a lot of times you know it's these massive rams and they're obviously illegal or whatever but a lot there's also lots of guys that are just like you know they got a nice sheep but it's not a a pig per se and you can look at those pictures and kind of get an idea what you're looking at because they'll usually have a nice side profile picture Mm -hmm. and just to get an idea what uh just more the more sheep you can look at the better for sure so yeah one night i was down in the the park uh southwest of here and i was just set up the spotting scope and there was there was about five or six of them on the side of a hill and I just watched them for as long as I could while they were yeah. feeding up and it was really interesting to see their behavior like they they seem to stay close together yeah. like clumping up like they got this big hillside but they're all within a little 20 foot area you yeah. know and, and and but just the whole thing you're looking at them they're on an angle they're constantly shifting their heads yeah. up and down to the side and to try to pick out which ones were legal and which ones weren't was really really tricky yeah yeah you got to uh really uh spend some time to look at them yeah. like even the season guys i know they won't just be like oh yeah unless it's like you know so obvious that yeah you know, one of those Cadman monsters or something, but, <laughs> yeah. uh, like the average ram you're going to come across, 
in a hunting situation, you're probably going to want to field judge it for more than five minutes for sure. And, you know, and they, they're not going anywhere. If, they're, if you're not chasing them, if they don't know you're there, you've got all afternoon to mm-hmm. yeah. look at them. So you might as well take your time, make sure you're doing it right mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. Um, figure, figure out how you're going to make a proper stock on them. And, you know, and I would also would encourage people not to try to buy a high, like a long distance rifle if they're starting out and shooting these things at seven, 800 yards and things like that. Like be a hunter and get as close as you can and, um, make a good shot and mm-hmm. put some time into it. So for the new guy, what would you say is a, a distance that they should be comfortable shooting if they're going out sheep hunting? Um, I like, I, uh, I'm going to take this from the perspective that the guy has been hunting for quite a while and has is pretty proficient with his rifle, but um, I would say be able to shoot 500 yards. And, like, I'm not going to... I don't mean, like, oh, you're going to see him at 500 and pull the pin, but if you, say, wound one at 100 and he runs off to four or 500, you're going to want to be able to put another bullet in him mm-hmm. um, before he gets over the cliff or whatever but um if you can shoot proficient um at 500 yards and closer you're set in my opinion but uh i would say like you should be able to get 200 yards for in most cases or closer even if uh if you got the right terrain to get up on them and yeah i think i've shot two out of my three sheep at under 300 yards for sure and then uh, the one in Alaska, the closest we could get just because of the train was 400. So, and that's further than I want to typically shoot on anything. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, if, if you can do 500 or 500 comfortably, I think you're... You're good. You're good, yeah. yeah. So what about, we should probably talk about game bags. Like you mentioned your zippered yeah. ones, but let's say the new guy gets one and you got to stay the night. Yeah. Like, what's a good way to operate and keep the meat and all that? Yeah. So, uh, so these game bags that I got now, they're kind of breathable. So, like, if you throw them in your pack, they're going to bleed all over it. But um, uh, if you if you don't have game bags and you're basically packing out in garbage bags, like I think most of us <laughs> have or do still, at night I would hang it up under a, a spruce tree so it stays dry, uh, number one, and uh, the air can blow by especially if you're in earlier season a later season it might not matter as much but just to get the air flow around it to keep the meat cool and whatnot and taking the bones out makes a big difference for that too if you get those leg bones out um, that'll help cool your meat exponentially quicker yeah. i find so yeah because john's making his own and then i actually bought my first set of kind of what i would call high-end game bags this year when oh, i was down in the oh, states oh, area. Yeah. caribou game bags oh, okay yeah so when John and I, I think we'd listen to podcasts about it too, and they were talking about kind of a, a rookie move for a lot of people is to buy those kind of mesh cotton ones. Oh, yeah. And the problem with those is as you get, you know, weight in it, and if, say you hang it from a tree or whatever, yeah, they, it has all those holes that the flies can go and, go and lay the and eggs. Lay eggs in. Yeah. So I got the synthetic breathable ones, and like you say, they wreck your pack or they get blood all over your pack, but I think you just wear you know, that, like a badge of honor. Anyway, like, yeah. Yeah. My, my pack's been in the bath, I think, three times now, and... Uh, most of it comes out. I think there's some stains on it, but yeah, yeah, yeah. it's a hunting pack. Right? Yeah, you're not wearing, like a badge of honor. Yeah, you're not yeah. wearing it in Banff. <laughs> yeah, the, exactly. uh, the other uh, tip too, if it's warm out and there's fl- is flies, um, I've never had to do it myself, but uh, black pepper on your meat's supposed to keep. I've flies heard of off. that. Yeah, but uh, I've, like I said, I've never actually had to try it myself. <laughs> yeah, me neither. And I heard another guy that got one early season when it was super hot out, and there was no chance of getting it out that day. And they actually bagged it, probably in garbage bags, which isn't a good thing to do, but they put it, they actually buried it in a mountain creek. Oh, yeah, yeah, I've to, heard. To bring the temperature I, down and keep the bears off, so. Yeah, I, I've uh, heard that, too. It sounds like it'd be work well anyway. Yeah. Have you ever had any bear encounters out there when you're hacking out your... Um, your uh, the only... Well, we've seen lots of grizzlies where the sheep are running around mm-hmm. and stuff, but uh, the only... A uh, real encounter that was like close. We had this huge old boar grizzly walk right through camp, and I mean like fifteen twenty feet away from us, and it, like it was probably the biggest grizzly I've seen on foot, and uh, it just looked at us and kept walking. Oh jeez! And um, 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I, the, uh, yeah, I grabbed my grabbed my gun, but like it wouldn't have done anything to like we would have been if it yeah. w- if it wanted to tear us up, we would have been toast before we could have yeah got it down. But it walked right through camp on the um, main trail, going up the drainage, and then these other two backpackers were ahead of us, probably half a mile. And uh, we talked to them on the way out, and they said it followed them right to the headwaters. Really? Oh, wow. Yeah. So they were ahead of it. They could see it behind them. They they were ahead of it, and they kept trying to scare it off, but it just kept just kept going. Kept going. It wanted to go somewhere, and it, but yeah, it followed them right up to the. And right, how many so, guys were in your hunting party that time? Uh, three. And, and he couldn't have been bothered. Just no, he didn't even look at us, and and uh, yeah, it was. Yeah, that was the closest one, but yeah, I've, we've. I've probably come across seen more grizzlies than black bears hunting sheep for sure. So. Yeah, yeah. You noticed an uptick in the number of grizzlies out there. I maybe? yeah, like that's uh, like I never used to worry about them at all, but now it seems like they're every time you turn around, turn around, they're there, and um, that's the one advantage of having horses in camp too, because their ears start perking up and looking at stuff in the bush, and you're like, okay, well, something's up. Something's up. And yeah, we actually. Uh, we're riding down the trail once and it was the alders were so thick we you couldn't really see and the berries were out and um the horse just stopped and i was like trying to get it to go and then i seen its ear it was looking down the trail and it's here so i kind of stood up in the saddle and there's a grizzly right in the middle of the trail probably 30 yards up so it's like having a radar yeah like you can they can the horses for sure can Early keep you out of, yeah, yeah keep you out of a little bit of trouble and luckily it just ran off once it realized we were there but yeah yeah it's definitely getting to be more of a concern now than it used to be for sure so well you're hearing more about it anyway like with the grizzly encounters with people so yeah. i don't know i mean there's a certain amount it would probably be education for people mm-hmm. how to behave but at the other end of it too is i think there's just more bears yeah and yeah for sure maybe I, not as fearful and I think there's a bit of a different attitude with them here too, because they've never been hunted. Mm-hmm. You yeah. know, like I'm sure if you talk to guys that are in BC, well, up until recently you could hunt them. Well, yeah. But I'm sure they have a much different attitude than the bears here do. Yeah, yeah. It's... More of a fear for fear of humans. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, I think they're apex predator, and if no one's chasing them, why would they be afraid mm-hmm. of you? Right. So, yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. So. So how about sheep habitats and um, like I know with the Wild Sheep Foundation they do a lot of projects to keep the sheep on the mountain. Yeah. Um, what are some things that we can do to improve their habitat and make sure they're healthy? Um, as an individual, it's pretty tough. Um, it, like sheep are heavily regulated; they're kind of like the apex species of the hunting world, the provincial mammal. So there's like a lot of there's actually is a fair bit of government. Um, um, involvement in anything to do with sheep. So like the big one though is ha- definitely habitat. Mm-hmm. Um, now like base, basically in the last 50, hundred years, there hasn't been a whole lot of uncontrolled forest fires, but, um, like the crown of the mountains definitely need to get burnt in a few areas. Um, just the forest encroachment is coming up onto that sheep wintering range and, um, whatnot. So it's, biggest thing is the habit or the forest encroachment and that has a few things that lets the predators get closer so cougars and wolves and grizzlies and stuff can get on them pretty quick if the forest gets too um, high up the mountain and uh, the other thing is when there's a forest fire it drops nutrients into the uh, soil and then the grasses grow um, way way better and there's with better grass there's bigger horns Mm -hmm. and like it's a big Good for elk, too? Yeah, good for elk. Like, it's good for everything, really, yeah. to have a forest fire once in a while. Mm-hmm. Um, so the habitat's, like, the big thing. But um, to get a burn done in Alberta, there's it's not just, oh, this user group wants to do a little burn on this little mountain here. It's, like, multiple stakeholders from multiple communities, Aboriginal involvement, government biologists has to be on board. Um, everybody's got to agree. And then if you ever get to the point where everybody does agree, then the conditions have to be right. Like they'd never burn it today because the, uh, the dry, the dry it's so dry. Mm-hmm. You'd have the whole country on fire and, oh, yeah. and whatnot. So, you know, if we had a super wet summer and fall, they might, maybe they'd consider it. But, um, typically the spring is when they're looking at doing some of that stuff when there's ground 
got a lot of moisture still and oh, okay and whatnot but uh, is there a certain like are there any aboriginal groups in alberta that are more sort of involved with the with the species than others or um i'm not really sure on that uh one at all like um, i'm not really aware of any specific band that's mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. oh sheep are our species and we're mm-hmm. here to steward them particularly I, there is like you know some uh aboriginal hunters for sure that hunt sheep and whatnot but um i'm not really aware of a specific group mm-hmm. of them that are big on the sheep stuff that are specifically focused on it I've heard the stone, like the Stony Indians uh, west of Calgary here. Like I've seen lots of pictures, uh, like old pictures of yeah. them hunting rams and stuff like that. And I was just curious if the mountain, like yeah. those guys that are yeah, they're living in the mountains for a long time or yeah, helping out at all. Probably uh, some of them. I uh, I can't remember the band, but um, down by Turner Valley oh, area yeah. there. Eden yeah. Valley. Pardon me? Eden Valley? Yeah, Eden Valley. And I we've run into a couple of those guys oh, up yeah. in the mountains there. But, uh, you know, typically you don't really... I haven't really seen a whole mm-hmm. um, a lot of them. I heard down in Waterton, sometimes they get some pressure down... Or like in that area, they get... Uh, I can't remember the band down there either, but they get a bunch of those guys. They'll go out and hunt them once in a while and oh. and stuff. But One thing I remember was super cool. It was this spring when we were in Moab. Like our families were in Moab together. <laughs> And for anyone that's been down there, it's kind of really, you know, rocky. It's just that reddish orange rock that you see yeah. in the postcard pictures. But we're doing one hike, and we came across this uh, this one slab of rock, and it had all these ancient pictographs on it. Oh, yeah. And it was that's all cool. the Indians hunting, and they had all these pictures of all the uh, desert bighorn sheep. And we we're kind of thinking, like, well, why is this here? And then we started looking around, and there was, like, a, probably wasn't even eight feet wide, eh? Like a funnel where you can guarantee, like, this was kind of a pinch point for the sheep. Yeah, brought them right down to the river. Brought them right down to the river. So yeah. probably back in the day when they were doing pictographs, like, that was... They were leaving that message saying, like, this is an awesome hunting spot for yeah, all the following it, guys. It was like all of a sudden, like, a light bulb went off, and we're like, this is directions on where to hunt. Yeah. yeah right here, you know. Yeah, and there's a, a really good old book by uh, William Hornady from the early 1900s. Mm-hmm. And that was, like... And it's really interesting. If you ever get your hands on it, it's called uh, Campfires on Desert and Lava. Oh. And it's back in the day when Amber Crombie and Finch was actually an outfitter supplying uh, like wall tents and oh, covered right? wagons <laughs> instead of uh, t-shirts, I guess. <laughs> yeah. And um, But it's about the, like they started out in New York and went all the way down to uh, Mexico back before there's roads yeah. going anywhere. And, and they talked about the same thing. They got into these... Um, I can't remember the mountain range now, but they got into the mountains and there's these little kind of dips in the desert mountain and uh, they had water in them and the sheep would come in there and that's where they were hunting these desert sheep, I guess, was yeah. kind of in over these little pinch points in the water holes. But uh, Very cool. But uh, even, the, even they, or back then, it was, I think it was like 1905 or three or something like that when he wrote the book and he said there was all kinds of shell casings uh, around this water hole, so and all this remnants of previous hunt kill sites, yeah. So, yeah. so people have been doing it for thousands of years, I guess. Yeah, probably. Neat. yeah. So that's pretty neat. Yeah, uh, we were talking on the phone earlier in the summer, and we were talking about that book, Horns in the High Country, and you yeah. read it as well. Yeah, with and Andy I, Russell. That's Andy another, Russell. Yeah, that's another really good read, and. Uh, I imagine you're the same as me. You're going through writing notes on oh That's this exact- drainage and that drainage <laughs> and this and that and that was exactly what I was yeah. doing when I was reading. Yeah, and then uh, when you get looking these places up, they're part of the park now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, but uh, yeah. Darn yeah. It. yeah, that's yeah. a good read uh, for local interest for sure. Yeah, if, uh, if anyone hasn't read that, and then the other one is the uh, famous Jack O'Connor sheep and sheep hunting. Yeah, um, everybody that's interesting sheep hunting needs to take a read through that yeah that's a good one yeah. um so one thing that's pretty controversial here is all this talk about them changing the regulations can yeah. you uh, speak to that at all and kind of what the arguments are on both sides yeah so um for the guys that are starting out that don't know uh the last few years the government's been talking about putting uh most of the sheep zones into a four f- or uh, sorry full full curl requirements south of the Brazu River. So pretty much all the stakeholder groups were 
against it for a variety of reasons, like uh, um, reducing opportunity and you're really... and Well, and I guess the, to start off with the government's argument or the biologist's argument was it's targeting um, trophy sheep was doing genetic harm to the species. And to put it into perspective, there's about 15,000 sheep in Alberta and about 200 get taken every year. So I just as a like re, like without being a, any kind of scientist myself whatsoever it doesn't even make sense to me that this would have any kind of an impact based on the numbers that hunters are taking but that's what they're um, trying to sell anyway like I said most of the stakeholder groups aren't in agreement uh, with that so um, last I think it was this spring or last after the season last year anyway they've kind of said they're putting it to bed for now but i think they just you know for the next year or two i don't think we're going to see a change but i'm pretty certain they've got their pencil sharpened and they're probably figuring out another angle at it because uh their option was either full curl or draw and a lot of guys don't want to do the draw because that means you're probably going to hunt sheep once or twice in your lifetime. Like it is in the States? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and and to get back to your point, we are talking earlier about Wyoming. Um, back in the day, Wyoming used to be like Alberta, like a big sheep culture, like with sheep hunters. Mm-hmm. And then they brought in their um, draw system. And now, you know, if you get one tag in your lifetime, it's you're doing good. But now there's only really a handful of outfitters that, outfit for them there for and if you get a tag you'd be crazy not to go with a guy unless you're local and know where to go exactly because you're Mm. not going to draw that tag twice so right um that's i see that the direction alberta goes if we end up going to full draw is Mm -hmm. it'll be 20 years for a tag you're going to lose all these sheep hunters because no one's going to be interested if they can't ever hunt them um full curl that's another kind of poison pill in my opinion as well just because um you're either gonna be shooting really young rams and it and even if you are getting the odd old one it kind of still falls into this genetic if the genetic harm theory is what you believe in well now you're not targeting four fists you're just targeting a different genetic um piece of that Mm -hmm. as full curl so are you actually doing anything different you're just raising the bar so i don't think that's really the answer either i guess i myself i don't know what the actual issue is because there seems to be the consistent number of um, rams being taken every year and i do think if they improve the habitat like by doing those burns and getting better feed and even controlling um some of the u population maybe um that would grow bigger horns for these sheep as well so that was going to be my next question was the you hunt. Yeah. And I think for a lot of people that are kind of um, don't know a lot about it, yeah, they think that's a wrong thing to do because they say, you know, the females yeah. are going to be the ones that produce more rams. But yeah. maybe you can educate us on that a little so, bit, why you hunting is important. Yeah, so there's, um, very, well, first I'll start with, there's very, very few Utah, uh, tags province-wide. And historically, like, back in, I want to say the 80s, it might, I don't know if my timeline's right there, but th- several decades ago, there used to be actually quite a few U tags, and when they were taking quite a few more U's, they were getting quite a bit better rams. And um, intrinsically, it seems wrong to kill a U. Well, no, that's just X number less sheep, but um, province-wide at 15,000 sheep, that's roughly close to carrying capacity for the ha- wintering range we have. Mm-hmm. Um, and the idea behind taking ewes is um, th- that winter range can only sustain so many sheep on it. So if you take a few of the ewes off, that alleviates the pressure on that range. You'll actually have healthier sheep versus having a larger herd that's half starved come spring, more susceptible to disease mm-hmm. and whatnot. And then also if there's more feed, the rams are, there's going to be better rams are just because they're eating more and whatnot so that's kind of the idea behind you management in a nutshell it's more complicated than that but yeah um, when you talk about wintering range it still kind of blows me away that we're in some areas that we're sheep hunting and mm-hmm. there are a lot of winter habitat for them and the government's still allowing cattle grazing in there yeah that's, what's uh, uh, what's the thought on that um for myself personally i 
surprised that they let that happen or if they don't or maybe they should fence it off at the bottom or something so they can't get up there but the other thing i've actually seen on wintering range which kind of blew me away too was the feral horses oh Mm -hmm. yeah and like i've seen a lot like there's a lot of them out there and uh i was glassing these sheep once and i bet you 15 20 of them walked up onto that and it was way up in the cliffs too it wasn't just in like the lower Mm -hmm. just above timberline it was way up there seen a whole string of them up there and um, the sheep got kind of pushed up into the cliffs the horses ate and ate and ate and then finally left and then the sheep would come down so those feral horses are displacing some of those Hmm. um, rams as well but it's not a good thing anyway in my opinion to have a cattle and those larger mammals in their uh, wintering range and eats them out of house and home before the winter even comes. So. Yeah. Does the Wild Sheep Foundation, like, do they take a stance on that and try to do anything with it? Or on, is it on the cattle, on the cattle grazing um, issue? More on, because I think the cattle grazing, like there's probably a few places that are big time affected, but they, their focus is more on the sheep um, because the sheep are 100%, like domestic sheep are 100% killers for wild sheep for disease for disease yeah so that's kind of more where we're focused on is the actual um, domestic sheep so keeping um, a buffer between the two habitat like between where the domestic sheep are and the wild sheep yeah that's right um now in alberta we're pretty lucky because we're the 99 percent of the um, domestic sheep are actually um, buffered by the forestry because mm. nobody's going to graze their sheep in the forestry because they'd all be eaten by wolves yeah. and cougars mm-hmm. and all the yeah. rest of it. So we're pretty lucky here in the States. They've got um, a lot bigger issues because they don't have that natural buffer. Down in southern Alberta, though, there is a few of these sheep um, farms or ranches that do have the potential to have uh, wild sheep come in contact with them. Mm-hmm. You know, they're, those livestock owners are being being worked with by the government people as well. Um, putting up things like double fences or possibly like talking to them about like oh can you graze them over here instead or and it just um, seems like reading those articles like even the wild sheep magazine and all that it sounds like they're fighting an uphill battle like every magazine you read about it's like oh this herds and has this disease or is in risk of this if uh if if a wild sheep ever comes in contact with a domestic sheep it's almost certain death that's Mm. just the really bottom line for it they'll get a disease or they'll pass it on mm-hmm. to the rest of the herd and um in the in like i said in the u.s it's a bigger issue i believe but like the wild sheep foundation the, the national group i know they've actually bought out uh, leaseholders for some of these sheep grazing leases um they've had to in certain areas one sheep's got infected and the, like in arizona i think there was um, some domestic sheep that got out of their pasture and wandered off and they killed like an entire unit off of wild sheep and stuff so it's Jeez. pretty pretty yeah. uh, serious i guess mm-hmm. anyway so mm-hmm. you were talking earlier about kind of the government as far as bighorn sheep they always kind of have a hand to play in it yeah um from what i understand they do a, an actual sheep count every couple few years is um, that still they try to do surveys um every few years and like unfortunately with like the resources that are available and even with uh, like private funding from groups like well Alberta Wild Sheep Foundation and whatnot they just can't do every unit every year and so they target well they'll do different units different years um the other thing is too they have to have the right conditions to do the survey and so um I think it was last year we were trying to do some surveys and the conditions weren't right so they couldn't fly and so kind of you, you miss your window there's okay. only a certain window they do it and whatnot so yeah the surveys are unfortunately not as prolific as what uh most guy people would like them to be but yeah they okay. do they do try to do um, population counts and surveys and so is that always an aerial thing or is there ever groups that go out on foot to uh they do any say counts? the most i know the goat guys will do on foot stuff mm-hmm. but uh, they say for sheep the aerials the only or the best or most effective way mm-hmm. to do it because you from the ground when people go in you just can't see all these sheep from like we we're talking before from like the valley floor mm-hmm. and then if you start climbing up while they're moving around and so mm-hmm. the aerial survey is really the most accurate and um the other 
thing too when they're doing surveys it's not a matter of just oh here's a three thousand dollars go fly for a couple hours you have to actually because it's considered harassment of wildlife Mm -hmm. so you have to actually get special um government permissions like there's all these bureaucratic uh, hoops to go through Mm -hmm. as well so it's not just a matter of we need money to do this and let's go flying next week kind of thing it's there's a there's due process okay. involved in that. So, um, so your involvement with the Wild Sheep Foundation, um, I'm sure you've learned a lot. Is is there anything you've been surprised by, like just interactions with the government and stuff that yeah. really surprised you? Yeah. So that was that was one of the reasons why I wanted to run for the board originally was because like I was like, well, we should be doing more. We should be doing this. Why can't we stop these rigs? Why aren't we doing this? Why aren't we doing that? And after I joined the board and learned how things actually work like the due process and the government and all the stakeholders involved and it's a very very difficult thing to get stuff done here like it's not that people don't want to it's not that there's no desire to do it it's like very bureaucratic lots of red tape lots of red tape um the the, uh, biologist that like the managing biologist for that area needs to be on board um, and then even if they are on board though, they've got superiors and then, you know, some of this stuff we're talking about needs to go right to the minister to get approved or signed off on. So it's not like, well, let's make a smart decision today and have it implemented next week. It's a very long drawn out process. And the other thing that was kind of interesting too, is, um, depending what the decision is and the ele- if it's a big enough decision in it, there's an election cycle well, they might not want to make that call if there's only six, eight, 12 months to an election. They might say, okay, well, let's wait till that time passes. And then if we get reelected or if there's a new administration, <laughs> then we'll bring it up again. And and even the regional biologists, I think, kind of look at that as well and say, okay, well, I've got this big management plan or big whatever I want to um, implement it doesn't make sense to push it right now. I'm going to wait six months till we see who's going to be my boss next kind of right. thing. Mm-hmm. So there's, yeah, that was the biggest eye opener was the uh, red tape and uh, stuff that you or I would say, well, it's just common sense that we would do this or it's just common sense. We do predator control. Mm-hmm. Um, once you get into the nuts and bolts of it, it's not as black and white um, as, yeah, as the average guy thinks, mm-hmm. I guess. So. Mm-hmm. And I've always wondered, so it sounds like the biologists that, you know, look after a certain unit or area, they obviously have quite a bit of pull. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Are they, you know, like, are they easy to work with? Are they, like, anti-hunter? Are they middle of the road? Or um, are some hunters themselves? Yeah, that's kind of interesting because, uh, like, they're just people like everyone else. Most of them aren't, that I've had the opportunity to come across, aren't hunters, but they're not necessarily anti-hunting, but they want, they've got their own idea of what things should look like. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of getting everybody's priorities in alignment with something everybody can live with. And like I was mentioning before, there's a lot of stakeholder groups. So the last time they tried to get the full curl regulation implemented, the stakeholder groups were pretty much unanimous saying, no, this isn't going to work for us. Mm -hmm. And that was what stopped it. They weren't able to push that. So um, was it strictly the biologists that were pushing that? Um, well, they've got their own, like, I'm going to say, they've got their idea of what they want to do, and then they've got their own scientists coming up with evidence to support what they kind of want to do, is <laughs> the way I view it, I guess. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, yeah, and I, I disagree with, like, uh, that's, that's a whole other discussion, but I kind of disagree with how they're coming up with some of their science, and it's based on an isolated... Um, test tube heard at Ram Mountain and yeah. it's not uh, representative in my opinion of what the whole pro- of the province I guess but and um, I think a lot of those can be kind of like surveys it depends what you want to ask or what you want yeah. to look at and that's you know it can give you a different answer than oh there's, the a, real, there's a real art to, to even crafting a survey too, yeah. yeah you know like depending on what you're out what outcome you want yeah and I, I like even working for a big company um, I know they've brought independent consultants in, but the answer was already there before they started, and they were just to prove this, like, 
Management. Yeah, they had an agenda. Yeah, the, yeah, they were just there to prove that this decision was the right one. They did their due diligence, but it was, you know, like you're saying, it just a little, to, yeah. just a little bias. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. So, well, I think it'd be worth talking about kind of the uh, misconception or whatever. Like when you look at the regulations, it says right there, trophy sheep. Yeah. And I think for a lot of the people that don't know any better, especially the aunties, it kind of gets their their hackles up. Yeah, yeah. So, um, what's your opinion on that whole, the whole quote unquote trophy hunting scenario? Yeah. So I've actually tried to think about that from a non hunter's perspective, and I'm not talking anti hunter, but someone that knows absolutely nothing about hunting. And all they know about it is what they've seen on Disney movies and <laughs> all this stuff. You know, you hear that word trophy hunting, nine out of 10 or probably 10 out of 10 people that don't hunt think trophy hunting is shooting an animal, taking the head, leaving the rest, and you don't care about anything. Mm -hmm. That's what the perception is Mm -hmm. by the non-hunters and the anti-hunters use that and just, you know, use it to, to their advantage, obviously. So like that, so I always try to think about it. From that perspective, if you're ninety percent of the population that doesn't know anything about it, you hear that word, you automatic that that's the first thing you think is you're killing these things just for the head. Yeah. Um, but when I talk to people and I try to talk to people almost every day about what hunting is and what we do and what is trophy hunting, and I tell people, you know, trophy hunting really is nothing more than you being a meat hunter, but being more selective. Mm-hmm. And once you start explaining to them that trophy hunters are actually, in my opinion anyway, trophy hunters are probably actually more beneficial than meat hunters because they're less consumptive. So if I'm trophy hunting for deer, I might not shoot one every year. I might shoot one every third year. Mm-hmm. And the one I'm going to shoot is going to be the old buck past his breeding prime that's less likely to make the winter than that doe or that one or two year old that's got a better chance of surviving a hard winter and whatnot so the my perspective that's actually probably more beneficial to be that more selective and taking those older Mm -hmm. animals and not just for the headgear but just as a management like as a Mm -hmm. management thing yeah um but that being said that's a hard sell to tell somebody that that's not familiar with hunting at all yeah. Like you can't say I'm a trophy hunter and it's the best thing you can do for conservation because they just won't get it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think it's a word that we got to maybe get away from. And I, I wrote an article about this once actually in Big Game Illustrated about, uh, it was shortly after that uh, bear incident with the uh, spear hunting. Oh, or yeah. Whatever. Yeah. And it was basically saying, like the article I wrote was, I wasn't saying, oh, this guy's a horrible person for doing this, but I was basically saying you know you got to really watch what you put out there because public perception is more powerful than reality absolutely it is and yeah, with facebook and all that yeah, stuff exactly yeah. if they perceive that as a non-legitimate thing to do it will get shut down and your rights as a hunter are only dictated by the voters mm-hmm. like the hunting is not your right like we think it is and they've i know we've got some law that says hunting's a right or uh i can't remember what the wording is exactly but it's basically like your right to hunt here but if all of a sudden the voters decide that they don't want that anymore it's gone change overnight yeah like yeah. they just change the law make it out you know they just but so you know we're at the we're really at the mercy of that 90% of the population that doesn't hunt. Mm-hmm. So we need to make sure that the perception that they have of what we're doing in our activities is legitimate and valuable. And yeah, they can see the value of what it brings to wildlife for our rights. will just slowly get eroded over mm-hmm. time. I was just going to say, I think like education too is a, like a big part of it. And that's yeah. what a lot of people like, not the antis, cause you'll probably never convince them, but the people kind of in the middle of the road. Yeah they don't understand a lot of it and a lot of the biology of it. Yeah. And we talked about holding patterns before. Like some people are just like, well, why do you just don't let the, let leave the animals alone and let just things go as is. Well, the way nature works is like there's highs and lows. Like, you know, there'll be yeah. some years that the vegetation's really good. 
and the animals are doing really well and it might go like that for a few years but eventually it'll be a hard winter yeah. you know not very much exposed grass and there'll be a huge die off and so that's i think one thing good to educate you know uneducated yeah. people about is that um, hunters are kind of a management tool so instead of those highs and lows in the population of the animals yeah. it's just kind of the same every year we kind of manage that so there's so you know less winter die-offs yeah and, and i heard one biologist um i think they put it best they were saying like the general public would never accept uh, certain species coming to the brink of extinction naturally mm -hmm. um and then another species getting way out of control they want everything balanced all the time and like you say in the natural cycles you do have those highs and lows but what we try to do as modern hunters and conservation practices is keep the populations relatively stable so mm -hmm. um, they're sustainable but um that's actually one of the discussions i have with non-hunters about okay well you convince me meat hunting is good or if you're taking the meat that's all good but what about predators mm -hmm. like they don't want bears or lions or, or cougars i should say and that type or wolves hunted and um I, I that's the discussion i bring up with them is you got a boat you know, on the one side is the predators and the other side is the ungulates if one side of that boat gets too heavy there's going to be serious repercussions. If the predators are too low and the ungulates are way too high, you're going to get a disease and it's going to wipe the whole herd out. Mm -hmm. um, on the flip side, like we have now, you got way too many predators, the ungulates get wiped out, and then the predators eventually are going to have to starve to death. Yeah. I really view what we do as the management. We're a, we're a tool management. Yeah. Can yeah. use to keep those populations. Oh, absolutely, we are. Yeah. It's it's a management tool that the province or whatever yeah. jurisdiction uses, you know, for that thing. And you look at you look at deer hunting. So, if deer hunting just magically stopped, like how many deer would there be? How many how many automotive collisions would yeah. there be? And then the next thing you know, the insurance goes up yeah and, insurance you know, companies would get involved and they'd be like you guys got to get a handle on this deer problem yeah. it's costing us millions or hundreds of millions of dollars a year and lost time injuries and all this kind of stuff right and yeah the whole thing about wildlife management and and all that it's such a big topic and it, yeah. it does make you wonder like what's what's it going to look like in 50 years yeah. 75 years you know and just to touch on that predator hunting too like you can talk to some people that aren't really educated about it and they say kind of why don't you let mother nature run its course and all that and the one other thing that a lot of people don't realize is that, you know, they kind of operate the same way we do as hunters, you know, the, the ground. So what makes us more effective? A lot of times we hunt the cut lines, we hunt the areas that yeah. have been clear cut. So, you know, things that we've done with forestry and development and all that are making those predators better than they should be. Yeah. And then they're taking, you know, more ungulates down because of it. So Yeah, and like bring up the cut lines, I didn't realize how many there were. Like in the north, especially, like I, I knew there's cut lines, but it, you know, when you fly overhead, if you look down, if you're heading north, it's like a checkerboard, like the mm -hmm. whole, the whole, like right to the um, Northwest Territories border, like every, every square mile has been seismic or, seismic. or surveyed or whatever. Mm -hmm. So, like, it's not like it's just in a few areas. It's you know everywhere yeah and that's not just in alberta either like bc is the same way but um and saskatchewan too now it's you know they everywhere has got cut lines and surveys and uh whatnot so yeah, yeah. like you mm -hmm. said the predators are super efficient compared to what they probably were in the past yeah i think well what are your plans for the autumn here um, they started already or are you well i was <clears throat> thinking of keeping her pretty close to home and maybe just going out to um west of rocky there or something yeah. uh, for a few days but then uh, my buddy from the yukon gave me a call and told me to come up so i think that's next wednesday i'm going <laughs> up there so nice yeah i'm gonna hopefully get a moose and so what part of the yukon are you going to uh to the tombstone range so it's pretty on that on the western western side of the yukon yeah you know, up that little tip there it's getting fairly high up and that like north of Dawson City there okay. a few hours so what do you expect for weather uh it looks like it's going to be 10 during the day and around freezing at night so okay oh not too bad eh yeah no it looked pretty pretty favorable <laughs> anyway. yeah right. and you've been you've been on lots of destination hunts in the past yeah yeah um, quite a few so. what would you say is your favorite one 
Oh man, that uh, I don't even know what the the number one was. Uh, the biggest adventure was none of it for muskox. Um, okay. Like the hunt, it, hunt was more of a harvest, but it there's just a total adventure of the whole thing and the cultural, cultural experience yeah, was yeah. unbelievable. Like the uh, guides we had, the one was born in a tent, and the only reason he was in a tent was in the summer. And uh, the other one was born in an igloo. Wow. <laughs> Not in Kansas anymore, eh? No. And these guys weren't that old either. Like, yeah. they were they were about 50 or so. And the one guy was saying that uh, they never got heat until um, 1980. <laughs> and even after the government built them houses and got heat, he said his dad wouldn't let them turn it on. So he never actually had... He like a heated house until he was like thirty. Unreal. So they were yeah. just living a in a cold house, just bundle up. And yeah, he, he said they had a uh, like they had an oil burning stove, yep. but they didn't want to pay for the oil. Um, they had like a wood stove, and he said like it would have to be pretty cold before his dad would let them light the wood stove <laughs> because to get wood was even even worse. Like, well, like yeah, because they'd have to take the dog sled to go get wood and then yeah. come back, so they didn't really want to burn it so yeah, yeah. They, but uh when we were up there it was end of april and it was minus 35 celsius during the day Jeez. and Holy smokes. and that it had warmed up from minus 50 a few weeks earlier and uh the guide i had slept in a cabin with no heat and he said the he the guy told me the one night he actually slept on top of the sleeping bag he was too warm in the sleeping bag <laughs> so they're just used to it yeah and uh and I, I kind of thought he was BSing me a yeah. little bit, but, um, then the day I got my muskox, like it was 30, 35 below and, you know, okay, hurry up, take some pictures and, you know, the camera f- was freezing up and stuff and, and, uh, you know, it's, muskox is a big animal. Yeah. Like it, the one I got, they figured was about 900 pounds, I think. Ooh, that's so a big critter. It, yeah. And, uh, anyways, so uh, we started working on it and I was having to put my hands in my jacket every 10 minutes to kind of warm them up. And he was out there with a pair of those white cotton gloves and they're just <laughs> soaked with blood. And he's like, oh yeah. I was like, are, are your hands cold? Like, do you need to warm them up? He's like, oh, as long as I keep working, I'm okay. And and wow. uh, yeah, he, he kept going the whole time till that thing was completely caped. Uh, we had all the meat off and ready to pack up before he stopped. And he was just like, ah. and then even after that, he never put his gloves on. He was... He was fine, and I was just, uh, my hands were frozen from, like, and I, I even actually put uh, those rubber gloves on underneath my mm-hmm. gloves just to keep my hands dry, because I knew it would help keep them warmer, and uh, I, my hands were still frozen, and he I was warming them up all the time, and he just worked out there with no problem, and he's like, oh, it's getting hot, and he's having his jacket open. <laughs> and, Minus 35 hot. Yeah, but... Uh, yeah, I never would have believed it unless I would have seen that. And yeah. then um, he said they did a trip to Victoria in January one time, and he said it was so hot for him. He thought it was so hot that he said he couldn't take it, and it was only plus 10. Really? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so they're used to pretty cold temperatures and stuff, but incredible hunters, though. Um, like, those guys are dialed in for yeah. what they're doing. And uh yeah, we found over 200 muskox, like, passed up before I took the one I did, and other guys in our group, we got a ring seal through the ice, um, we got a wolf, uh, arctic fox, and saw a couple inland grizzlies, actually, up oh, there. Wow. Yeah, and then, uh... How did they look compared to our grizzlies? Were they bigger or smaller? Or? Um, typically they're smaller, but these ones were seven and a half foot bears, so they Pretty said that's a, that was a good size bear for, yeah. uh... For up there especially, but yeah. um, I think you were telling part of the story at Sheep Camp there, and you're also saying uh, it was really neat watching them because you kind of got to see how they hunted traditionally. Because didn't they cover some huge amount of land within the year? Yeah, yeah. The um, the one guy there, he was that that was born in the igloo. He uh, lived a real traditional lifestyle. So at certain times of the year, he'd be at different spots, and as far south as Yellowknife. And Yellowknife to uh, Cambridge Bay is like a long ways if you look at it on the map. It's an airplane ride away. Yeah, exactly. And but they would be, he's like, oh, we'd spend three days in Yellowknife, and then we'd 
like basically jump on their snowmobiles and their 16 foot freighter sleds with a couple barrels of gas and <laughs> making their way to the next spot and but yeah this time of year we're here because we collect duck eggs and then we're over there because it's good fishing and and then the other thing that was real interesting was there's a nook shucks everywhere out there mm. like everywhere and uh they all mean different things based on the way they're built and the direction of the arm and the angle of the arm and um, some mean that it's good fishing at a hunting ground. Some is pointing to direction of travel. Like they all mean different things, and to me, they all looked They're pretty similar. They look the similar, just like a car or whatever. They're all, it's all a car, right? So, yeah. Um, but to them, it all meant they all meant something from their the way they were built, I guess. So, yeah, that was really interesting, though. And uh, yeah, I definitely recommend it as well. And it, for how big of a trip it was it really wasn't that expensive even uh-huh. if you were to pay full price for it it's probably one of the more affordable destination hunts assuming you don't get held up in town <laughs> <laughs> get held up in town the hotel and the grocery bill gets a little steep I oh, guess. Okay. but uh, oh yeah food's probably pretty pricey up there isn't yeah it? i think it was uh 28 dollars for a two liter of orange juice <laughs> oh wow Are yeah you serious yeah <laughs> Jeez. it was crazy expensive like uh yeah you wouldn't want to have to buy groceries there yeah. Uh, yeah it's pretty pretty expensive but uh yeah, it was just a really cool hunt. Like, we actually um, snowmobiled eight and a half hours across the Arctic Ocean to get to our first camp. No, many guys can say that. No, no that's for sure. No, it was unreal. Like, it, and these guys traveled without, like, they had, um, I guess, GPSs or whatever. I think that was more to give us peace of mind because they never <laughs> yeah. pulled them out once. Like, they just, and you're driving across the ocean out there and it's flat as a pancake for seems like a million miles and they're just like oh yeah i just know we gotta go this way and they just know where to go i yeah. guess and unreal yeah it was uh, yeah it was pretty pretty cool uh trip up there so yeah that sounds really neat so how far away from here are you from getting your grand slam uh, i just need a desert sheep i guess that's the big one of the four eh? yeah yeah in terms of uh price i guess that's the that's the big ticket one there, but uh, hopefully get pull the tag for that one instead of having to go to Mexico. But so, how does that work for a Canadian or any non-U.S. resident? What's it look like? Um, for a non-resident tag, yeah, your odds are pretty low, but um, there's a few states that are completely random, and that's probably your best shot. Um, New Mexico, they've got a non-resident um, outfitter outfitted hunt so if you go in that your odds are basically double um what they would be otherwise um but that's probably your best shot is actually new mexico in my opinion okay because it's completely random and if you go in the outfitter pool which you're probably going to go with a guide anyway if you're going down there because you don't know the area yeah that's probably the best you just got to be willing to pay the piper eh? yeah yeah (laughs) yes or my luck i'll uh save up the scratch and go to Mexico and draw the tag the next year or something. <laughs> <laughs> Be my luck. But, uh, yeah, so that's, uh, I think that's probably a few years down the line yet, unless something big You win deal, the lotto? Yeah, yeah, or some big deal comes up or I can go for a fraction of the cost. So, yeah. <laughs> And I always like to ask all of our guests on here, if you could only have one rifle to oh, hunt with boy. the rest of your life, what would it be? Well, that's uh, interesting. Probably my two seventy. So I've got, um, like most guys, a closet full of guns or whatever. <laughs> and uh, I never t- have too many. <laughs> no. And uh, my I got this old two seventy. My dad gave me when I was fourteen. I guess it was new at the time. And I've taken every animal I've ever taken with that rifle, even though I've got all these other ones that I've awesome. taken out and. So I've got all my sheep with it, and if I get this um, moose, I'll have taken one of every species category in North America with it too, so bear, all the rest of it. Right so, on. So, yeah, so, but, uh, yeah, you know, there's, you know, there's probably, for a thing like a bear, there's probably a better caliber than 270, but... Gets the job done? Got the job done. So. <laughs> <laughs> right on. Yeah, and then uh, we were also wondering, how did you get into writing for magazines? 
Oh, that's well, that's another long uh, <laughs> long story. But uh, back when, uh, well, there's two pieces to it. Back when I was first married, we didn't have like any money, like most people, and I wanted hunting gear. And I was reading this uh, magazine. It's like, oh, if you get published, we'll send you this gear package. I was like, well, geez, maybe I can get some gear. <laughs> and I got published a couple times, and they sent me some, you know, gear. Like, it wasn't a whole pile of stuff, but a few things. I was like, oh, that ain't bad. And if I, maybe if I can uh, get, you know, a few more, maybe I'll get the rifle one day or whatever. <laughs> that's never happened yet, but... Uh, so that's how I started submitting stories or whatever end. But then uh, eventually uh, it kind of led into like a column in Big Game Illustrated there. And So is that every episode now you're writing for? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That, and I usually try to keep it like, because like I always want to dive into the weeds on stuff, but mm-hmm. you got to kind of think, oh, it's this pretty general audience. So there's like guys that know what this and there's guys that know nothing yeah. and everywhere in between. So I try to keep it more generalist than yeah, like 30,000 foot view kind of thing yeah versus uh, and more topics like you know for like discussion type topics like say like when that spear bear thing yeah. went like just writing about like you know you need to be aware of what we're doing and mm-hmm. stuff and things for to give people things to think about versus debating the difference between a 30 odds like yeah. all the yeah. very technical specs on uh, yeah. different rifles because like that's really not my thing anyway is the and nine out of ten people get nothing out of a technical article, I think. Yeah. Anyway, so yeah. try to keep it a little more uh, general, I guess, that way. But And how's the podcast article coming? Is that out? Yeah. Uh, it is? Oh, it's, I don't think it's out on stands yet, but it's, okay. uh, it's, in, it's going to be in the next uh, okay. issue coming out there. Well, we'll so. have to buy that one. Yeah, we're going to have yeah. to buy that one. Did you omit most of our... No, actually, I used a fair bit of... It's it's tough to uh, incorporate everybody's comments because you only have so much, so many words or so much space, but you got so much to talk about. And yeah. So it's um it was kind of more of a, like a a lot of people don't know about podcasts I find in hunting until you start saying oh you should check out this it's actually pretty interesting. Yeah. Then they start listening to them then they really like them but I found like most hunters don't listen to them mm-hmm. and uh, so it's kind of, it was kind of like. Uh, you know, you should check them out if you want, if you're looking for, or there's all these different kinds of hunting podcasts. Yeah. And so your guys was like, obviously focused towards like the new hunters and the guys just trying to get into things. And, um, you got a guy like say Jay Scott, that's very, um, you know, he's catering more for advanced hunters mm-hmm. and guys that are looking for real technical specific things. And then you got a guy like, um, say Steve Rinella from Meat Eater that's, um, He's kind of more well versed on or well read on a lot of issues, current event issues, mm-hmm, like mm-hmm. more in the U.S., but kind of interesting and and uh, whatnot. So it's just more to bring awareness to some of the stuff that's out there for guys to check out. And yeah, right on. And some of the, you know, incorporated lots of your guys' comments, obviously. And good deal. Yeah, yeah. that's cool. John's yeah. actually the one that put me on the podcast last year, and then here we are now. Yeah, I don't even know what got me on podcast. I remember a buddy of mine said something about podcasts like probably seven or eight years ago, and I just, I just thought, whatever, that's for nerds. That's for <laughs> yeah. you know what I mean. Like, and then you find something you like about you know yeah. a subject you like, and you can yeah. really, uh, you can really dive into it. That's for sure. I yeah. find it's yeah. awesome too, driving down the road, listening to a podcast, oh, yeah. kind of picking stuff up instead of listening to the same song for the ten thousand time. Yep. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, exactly. It's all good. Yeah, no, I found, um, yeah, I bet it's only been the last year, so I've been listening to right. them as well, and um, I was just the uh, same kind of thing. I ran up, well, what I liked about it was you don't have to use your eyes. Mm-hmm. So if you're driving, you obviously can't be watching something, yeah. and if you're working, you can't be looking at something. Um, you just have to listen to it, so. Right um, But whereas, you know, any other media, yeah, it's visual. Yeah. So, uh, some kind of, like, you can't read a magazine, you can't watch TV, you gotta, without taking your eyes off of what you're doing. So. Yeah, 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 exactly. So, it's been kind of great that way, but... So, do you find the writing, is that, like, when you're out hunting, are you thinking about, oh, this would be a good article, and you're kind of, like, is it affecting the way you view things a little bit? Or? Um, for the most part, uh, I'm gonna say no, um, and mainly just because when I'm out there, I'm just kind of enjoying the whole 
mm. experience or whatever of it. But then once in a while at night, if it gets an early night, I'll be thinking like, oh, I'm going to have to remember to include this if I like in an article or whatever. I think people would find this interesting and mm-hmm. whatnot. And uh, I guess, the, well, the other thing I was going to mention too, like how, why I started uh, or kept up writing even after I didn't need to uh, get the gear, get the gear <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> was um, I, a lot of the trips I've done is because I've read articles that other people have wow. written. I, I remember the first one I, I read that I was like, I'm going to do this trip, like this exact trip. And it was a uh, Buffalo, South Dakota, Buffalo hunt, but it was at Mount Rushmore in Custer state national park. Cool. Oh, that'd be pretty cool. And I'm like, I'm doing this trip one day. So I went and researched how to pull a tag for it. And I could, I got the points. I could go anytime now, but I, that was the, literally the first trip I read about that. I was like, I'm going to do this hunt. And then the more I kept reading other people's stories, the more I wanted, to, oh, I, I want to go and try this hunt. I think I'd like that. And then I thought, you know, if I did this great trip, I should write about it so other people can know that it's out there and there's more than just what's in your own backyard. Yeah, for so sure. To speak, so. You ever hunted in Montana at all? I haven't. I've been uh, toying with that idea for yeah. quite a while because it's so close, but um, I should be building points there. I haven't been, but uh, Wyoming, I've been building a lot of points there oh, yeah. um, for antelope and elk and um, I was going to do sheep and moose too but uh, the way they've got their draw system uh, for the more like I'm going to call it like prestigious or sought after species they've got like a way higher entry fee uh, so like moose I think I want to say 80 bucks or something to put in for a point and you know it's going to take you years and years to get a point there you gotta so really ante up if you want it if you yeah exactly yeah. and sheep's the same way i think it's like a hundred 150 dollars to put in for the draw for sheep there oh wow so, so you gotta be in it for the long game and really want it if you're gonna do it there but elk and antelope are pretty affordable though like i think antelope's 10 or 15 bucks to put in and elk i want to say it's I think they raised it to 30 or something, but oh, they must generate a ton of revenue from oh, that. Yeah. Up. Yeah. They must. Yeah. And, it, and the other thing too, it keeps guys like myself out from putting in for everything just for the sake of putting in mm-hmm. for everything. So yeah. yeah. Like, Oh, I guess that's our situation here. Yeah. yeah. I was actually thinking about that this year as we're as as doing, doing all, all the draws. online tags. <laughs> I basically, we can hunt pretty much everything except for grizzly here. Yeah. And I spent just over $300. So I think if you talk to a lot of guys from the States to hunt what we're hunting for $300, it's just unheard of. Yeah. Like we're still so lucky here. Yeah. Like if you put in, depending what state it is for a sheep tag, you're looking at two, three hundred dollars just to apply. Yeah. So because they make usually make you buy the license regardless, like the they call it like a license, and then the tag is on top of or like the draw fees on top of it and stuff. So it doesn't take long to get to three hundred dollars yeah. applying down south. So. Yeah, that's for sure. So yeah, we're pretty fortunate here to. Yeah, that. big time. Yeah, it's the land of uh, it's like the golden land of, yeah. of hunting for sure. Hey, yeah, for residents anyway. Yeah, yeah. And, like. Well, I guess like the draw system is a whole nother podcast on its own because that's pretty controversial how they do it. But um, what I always tell guys is even if they raised like the entry fee for the draw to a hundred dollars a tag, um, and you can't afford to put in for any of them, you can still pretty much hunt every single species over the counter here, other than the say mountain goat and mm-hmm. yeah whatnot. Like you know you don't need to pull a tag to hunt an elk or a sheep or. Uh, I guess moose is all in draw now, but um, never used to be. But uh, oh, you can do an awful lot of hunting here with just over the counter tags, yeah. like yeah. more than more than I would ever have time for. So, you know, I I look at the draw myself as a bonus. Yeah, like, yeah. Like I only I only put in for the premium areas for the draw, and if I got to wait ten twenty years to pull it, so be it. I guess. But in the meantime, I can hunt nine out of ten other units for the same species, and yeah. And, uh, yeah, a lot of opportunity, I guess. So you got anything else that you hunt on a regular basis other than sheep? Or? Uh, yeah, I used, to, well, I kind of toned it down a bit in the last, uh, three or four years, but uh, white tails in Saskatchewan is oh, yeah. said from there or whatever. So yeah. my cousin's got a really big ranch and his neighbor's got just a ungodly amount of land and lets us basically go wherever. So, uh, we'll go down there, go down there most uh 
falls, I guess, and, you know, socialize with everybody, obviously, yeah. and then, you know, go out to get some pretty good deer hunting in as well. So that, that, that used to be the staple, I guess, was the whitetails. And then uh, once I got to the mountain hunting, now I'm kind of addicted to that, I yeah. guess. It's hard to... Yeah, two extremes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I always think, oh, I want to get old and can't do much hiking anymore. I can always go hunt deer <laughs> or <laughs> uh, go to Africa, I guess. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, that's, how about your, your, you guys, do you guys do any? A little bit of everything. Yeah, I think for us, I'm good. kind of the ma- jack of all trades, master of none. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, we were just out actually moose hunting uh, archery yesterday. Oh, nice. And deer, I guess. Uh, but, yeah, a little bit of everything, elk. Black bear, sheep. Yeah, anything that's unfortunate enough to walk in front of us <laughs> yeah. at a given moment, you know. Yeah. But yeah, no things I like. I I like hunting mule deer. Like things I I like. Well, elk too. Just find a fascinating animal. And yeah. Sometimes it seems like the animal you, you start you want to learn more about it. You you know and you really uh, you sort of get captivated by it that yeah. way. And I find that with elk for sure. Where yeah. it's like I can't seem to know enough about. Mm-hmm. Uh, but but where they want to be and where yeah. they are and stuff like that. So hopefully I'll get another one this year. Hopefully yeah. we get some rain and we oh, get man. the country will open up again. Yeah, no, it's been pretty brutal here yeah. this fall for being dry. And yeah, it's been so dry. And... Yeah, like where I was in the south there, I I know like we're in ranch country and I noticed, mm-hmm. you know, if you're not from a ranch, it's, it, it all looks like yellow grass, right? Yeah. And I was like, oh yeah, it looks the same as always. Anyhow, I... Uh, I, I noticed the cracks in the ground, like there was some serious cracks in the earth and it was like, you know, like when a mud puddle dries up and yeah. there's those big cracks, but it was like that, but it was just in the grass, but the cracks were two inches thick. Oh and, man. And I just thought, you know, it's probably pretty bad for the animals out there at this time yeah. too, yeah. right? Yeah. Unless so, they can find water. Or... Yeah. We should probably kill them and do them a favor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We'll find them. Steaks yeah. or... Yeah. Yeah. What? Um, well, thanks a lot, Chris, for joining us. I think yeah, uh, myself no and everyone, all our listeners, learned a lot. Yeah, and when we turn off the mic, you can tell us exactly, uh, yeah. maybe point <laughs> us in the right direction. It doesn't have to be exactly where to go, yeah. just maybe in the right direction. All right, guys, for our listeners, don't forget to subscribe on iTunes. And if you enjoyed the podcast, please leave a review. For any questions, comments, suggestions, or stories, feel free to email us at highlanderhuntingpodcast at gmail.com. Until next time, thanks for listening. Thanks.